Board meeting, Tuesday, April 13, 2004. And if we would please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Adjustments to the agenda. We have none for this evening, so our agenda is as it's listed. Um, approval of the March school board minutes. Uh, can we have a motion to approve the minutes? Elaine? As, I'm sorry, go ahead. I move that we accept the minutes for our March school board meeting as presented in our packets. Second? Second. Ann? Yeah. Okay. Um, all in favor? Any discussion? I'd like to make a friendly yes. amendment to the yep. and minutes. Um, I noticed that when I read through the minutes that they didn't include um, my concerns over the inclusion of extended family members to the nepotism policy. And I'd like to have that added to the minutes of the meeting, if you would, Mary. Thanks. Okay. Is that it? Is that it, Kathy? Yes. Okay. Um, all in favor? Do we need another motion? We have motion. to make a new motion. Okay. I'd like to make a, a second motion uh, for approval with the adjustments uh, that Kathy Ray has re re requested um, in addition to the minutes as presented. A second? Second. Okay, Ann. All those in favor? Six, zero. I wasn't here. Okay, our high school students this evening. Um, I don't see anyone. Um, middle school students. Nora, Kevin. Hi, I'm Kevin Johnson. Um, the a dance is coming up on April 30th, and since the last dance was canceled, students are very anxious to have another dance. The school musical Bye Bye Birdie has come and gone. They performed last weekend, and they had good showings to all their shows, so it went well. Spring sports started this week, and kids are ready to get started up with sports again. Uh, World Language Week is this week, and French and Spanish teachers are planning activities for their classes, and it's going well so far. The March social went well, and even though it came on the same day as the track meet, there was good showing, and everyone had fun. Honors band and chorus members went to Scarborough High School to perform with kids from all over the state, and I'm sure it was a great concert. The magazine drive was a hit again this year. Students raised money for their outdoor experiences like Chewanki and Camp Kiev. And here's North. Um, like Kevin said, the Bye Bye Birdie went really well. Everyone performed great. As each show went, they progressed in their performance. Um, everyone, teachers and students, are getting excited for spring break. The annual Student Council sweatshirt sale is underway, selling sweatshirts jackets and flannel pants, and this is an opportunity for the student council to make some money. The magazine sale just ended last week, and that went very well. Students in fifth and sixth grade were all determined to sell the most magazines. The student council is currently in involved with a project with the Silver Rights Group. The project includes making welcoming kits and groups of people for when new kids come to our school. The student council is also getting ready for the last dance they will run on April 30th. Baseball, boys lacrosse, and softball all started last week, and girls lacrosse and track started yesterday. Any questions? Any questions? For no? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kevin and Nora. High school. <laughs>
Report cards were distributed today during the school hours, which put somewhat of a damper on learning for those of us whose grades had fallen and perhaps invigorated those who did well. I heard comments that indicated that the disruptive element of receiving report cards in the morning and also felt that the morning distribution may have contributed to even more grade comparison than usual. We also had roundtables this morning for seniors, creating discussions about transitions. The roundtable for the rest of the student body pertained to drugs, alcohol, and cheating. The SAC met last week, and concern over changes in the cafeteria were brought up as we learned of new state laws concerning eliminating vending machines and the possible piggybacking of a bake sale ban on this statute. The SAC and other student groups hope that bake sales will continue as they spread good cheer and act as fundraisers for various causes. For example, the Gay Street Alliance sold mint brownies on one of the days that they set up a table meant to gather interest in a signing up for the Day of Silence, an encouraging new effort at CEHS that demonstrates our ability to support one another. Um, other, another SAC issue was the fact that we wanted to have a, a school board member on the Nutrition Advisory Council. Our SAC president um, has gone to a few of those meetings and felt like the interests of the uh, SAC and the school board would be uh, in, a, in alignment on some of the issues and that by working together, uh, the SAC could achieve some of their goals on that committee. Um, and there's a lot of concern over that. But other SAC news includes upcoming elections and a possible Earth Day Recycling Awareness Week. The STP Senior Transition Project appears as though it will continue this year despite some slow senior difficulties in meeting deadlines. There was some possibility that the whole senior class, including those who had handed in proposals, would be doing some cleanup work on school grounds, but it doesn't seem much has come of this. Though some of the seniors thought that these service hours would have been unfair, I don't see anything wrong with pitching in, though I understand that some seniors might have had prior conflicting commitments. Other less contentious news includes sports team success and the eagerly awaited arrival of spring. Does anyone have any questions? Um, I have a question. Is the nutrition council that you're talking about different from what Paula Harris is? No, it's the same one. It's the same yep. one. And so you're asking for a school board member to? Yeah, I think that, I think that uh, Dan Clucci, our president, felt like the school board would have similar interests to that of the SAC in having a voice to contrast the voice of parents of um, younger children, I think. Those parents are more involved in it than parents of high school students. And as a result, uh, parents with younger children, I think, are more uh, in pursuit of regulating what's in the cafeteria, whereas parents with older children have kind of learned to let their own children make choices. And so there's a difference in the way the situation's being handled in the cafeterias, I think. Okay. Um, at the last meeting, there were three of us, Anne, myself, and Kevin, who were at that meeting. Oh, good. Um, and I think if, if there is a school board, I'm not sure when the next meeting is. Uh, yeah, that was another difficulty that Dan had expressed was the scheduling of the Nutrition Advisory Council and that the cafeteria ladies also weren't notified about the meeting until the very last minute. And um, as a result, hadn't had any input about the elimination of cookies and things from the, uh, those items for sale. Okay. All right. So, so we will um, find out when the next meeting is, and, and I think someone from the school board will be represented. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Communications? Uh, uh, I just have a couple things I'd like to <clears throat> mention. You do have in your packet um, a letter from uh, Mia Jordan, um, who is a uh, life skills teacher at the high school, letter of resignation. I also have a copy of letter of resignation from uh, school board member Rich West. Um, and also in your packet, under communication, as a list of all the probationary um, first and second year teachers, which you will be taking action on 
at your next meeting. Uh, you get the list now, so you have a chance to take a look at that. If you have any questions or concerns, um, please get in touch with me so that if you, I can get the answers to some of those questions and let you know what, why that status is the way it is. But uh, any of those concerns you might have, we want to get those brought out prior to the next meeting because the next meeting you won't be taking action. Okay, so that is both for continuing contract status and second year probationary. Right. Comments from the public, we have none this evening. Uh, recognition, we have none. Uh, superintendent's report. Um, before we have the French exchange uh, group report, um, just an update. The uh, Cable Education Foundation, as you know, um, has been very active in the last couple of years, and they do. I just wanted to let you know, if you didn't already know, that they have a, a newly elected president, uh, Patty Grennan. Uh, I think the, the group has done great with Annie Cohegan over the past several years, and Annie's passed that on to Patty. And there are several new members that are involved with the um, executive board, um, but they're very actively looking at a strategic plan. Hopefully, that will be in place um, there, and they also are beginning another grant cycle. Um, they're meeting with some parent groups and looking at getting feedback. They actually will be meeting with the district leadership team tomorrow. Um, looking more toward some larger scale system-wide initiatives and funding for that rather than specific uh, small mini-grants at the schools um, and looking at some real innovative and creative ways to, to do some of the things that we do. Um, so they're still very strong and I think uh, we'll be undertaking their capital cap campaign in the fall. And the only other item is um, report, I think uh, David Perry is here. Good evening, my name is David Peary. I'm a French teacher at the high school and I'm here to report, as I said I would when you so graciously gave us permission to undertake this exchange a few months ago on how it's gone so far. Uh, we spent two and a half wonderful weeks in France between February 12th and March 1st and now we are in the middle of hosting the students who hosted us when we went to France. Rather than to tell you my point of view at this point, I think I'd like to introduce Pat Myers, one of the students, a senior at the high school who participated in this program, and he'd like to share with you some of his experiences. Uh, like Mr. Perry said, my name is Pat Myers, and I was one of the 13 students that was lucky, and lucky enough to go over to, and take part in the exchange trip uh, a couple weeks ago. Just to give you a quick idea of what we did, we, uh, our first three days we spent in Paris and we got to see a lot of the big landmarks like the Eiffel Tower, Arc de Triomphe, uh, Musée d'Orsay, Louvre, all the other things that were just incredible. And unfortunately, one of those days I got to miss out on because I managed to get sick on, I think, some raw oysters that I had the night before <laughs> at the Eiffel Tower. But I found that it was a good idea to have a, a grocery bag, a plastic bag in your pocket, just in case you ever feel sick in a metro station, <laughs> which I got to find out. So uh, after those three days in Paris, uh, we left for Saint Nazaire, which is a small uh, town on the coast, on the west coast, on the Atlantic Ocean, and it's a lot like uh, Cape Elizabeth in the Greater Portland area. And for that first week, they had a school vacation, so we got to spend time with the family and see what family life in France is like, which was a great experience for us. And we also got to do some more sightseeing. I got to go see some of the Chateau in the Loire region and also the city of St. Malo, and also got to see Mont Saint Michel. The final week, was, which was one of my favorite weeks there, was uh, we got to go to school with the French students, so we got to see what a school was like in France. Uh, the school that we went to, it was a lot different than Cape because they had 2,500 students total. Their school day went from 8.30 in the morning to, oh no, 8 in the morning to 5.30 at night. And uh, they had an hour and a half break in the middle there. But personally, I like the 7.30 to 2 schedule that we have here. <laughs> but uh, it was a great experience for everybody that was involved. We got to learn a lot. We got to see how well we learned the language. and if actually what we were learning in class would be applicable anywhere else, which it turns out that it actually was. And uh, over the course of the two weeks, you could definitely see in the, the improvement in our own understanding as well as the speaking aspect of the language. But uh, one thing I still haven't quite figured out is why that 
American regular bathing suits aren't allowed in French pools, which I definitely found out the hard way when I was handed a Speedo and <laughs> got in the car and went to the pool. So <laughs> that was fun. But definitely, <laughs> all in all, it's definitely a very valuable experience. And on behalf of all the students that were involved, I'd like to thank you for letting us take part in this little trip of ours. So thank you very much. I'd like now, like now to present Mr. Paul Michaud, um, a father of one of the participants in the exchange. Bonsoir, Monsieur et Madame. Je m'appelle Peter Michaud et j'habite à Cape Elizabeth depuis 18 ans et à l'état du Maine toute ma vie. Now I'll switch to Maine, the second European language. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the school board. My name is Peter Michaud and I have lived in Cape Elizabeth for 18 years and in the state of Maine for my entire life. Uh, my daughter Elizabeth Michaud, who was a junior at the high school, was lucky enough to take part in the exchange program and is now lucky enough to take part in it as a host. Uh, we have a young man by the name of Thibault Herbin who is staying with us and it's been a pleasure for us so far and I hope for him. Uh, I'd just like to make two points about this program for you folks tonight. First is that we forget sometimes what an important part France played, particularly in Maine's history. Um, you may all know that uh, the French were the first, at least the first non-Viking Europeans to uh, go by Cape Elizabeth and see the shore here. Uh, you may, may or may not know that the first European settlement in the state of Maine was on St. Croix Island in 1604 settled by the, actually the same French people who had come by, led by Samuel de Champlain. Um, approximately one-third of the population of the state of Maine has some significant French ancestry. Some of us are 100%, but that's what you get when you come from the St. John Valley. Uh, the other point I wanted to make is that uh, our kids who took part in this program are aware of some of the benefits of doing it now. Uh, you heard Pat talk about the, the pluses and maybe a little bit of minus. But uh, one thing that they perhaps aren't aware of is that they will continue to learn as the months and the years go by how much they have gained from this experience. The idea of being exposed not only to people from another culture but to being immersed in another culture uh, and learning that just as Americans are not unidimensional, French are not unidimensional either. Uh, and when we read about the French said this or the French did that, I think our kids now know that it's a little bit more complicated than that. And to me, that's a wonderful piece of education for them. I want to thank you all for your encouragement and support of this program in the past and ask you to continue it in the future. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Questions? Thank you, Mr. Michelle. And my apologies to Peter for calling him Paul. Um, that's my name. <laughs> oh. oh, that's what I was thinking. That's why I love supportive parents here. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce the two French chaperones who, who are participating in this program, please. Um, we have Beatrice Leger and Guy Descou. Nice to meet you. I'd like to thank you for making it possible for us to be here today and especially in the name of our students, Jean-Baptiste, one of our students is here. I think they all appreciate their stay and they discovered the American culture in a way we couldn't explain it to, to them uh, in France. And as Mr. Michaud said, they discover that things are not exactly what the media tell us or what the stereotypes uh, would lead us to believe. So I would like you to, I would like to thank you really. I'm going to thank you, you, me too, because it has really been a, a success. Actually, it is our second exchange, and this time, just like in the year 2000, uh, our students have had the opportunity to learn a lot about family life in both countries, school life, and of course they have certainly improved their fluency in French and English. 
So we are really looking forward to having a, another exchange, maybe next year or another year. Thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you both, and, and we welcome you to our community and, and hope that this will be a wonderful experience for you as well as it was for our students when they were in your country. In closing, I just I happen to notice that we have three parents of uh, exchange participants here. Um, Ms. DeSena here, Mr. Brown, and Ms. Johnson in the back there. Um, it's, it's been a wonderful program. It's gone far beyond the 13 students who've participated in it. Um, I had them into my French 6 class the other day, and I said, well, do you have questions for them? And someone says to me, no, we've been hanging out with them all week. We don't have any more questions for them. I said, oh, okay, well, let's go to plan B here. Um, it goes far beyond. It's not just the students who participate in France or in the United States. It's all the students who are able to meet these students, see them at lunch, uh, see them at track practice after school, uh, have them in class. Um, there's one young man who was off playing soccer with them the other day. So it goes far beyond that. And, and our, our reach is far greater than just the students who go back and forth. And as Patrick discovered, there are ups and downs to this, but that's what makes the program so powerful. It's more than seeing the Eiffel Tower. It's more than being able to eat croissant, although they are very good. Um, <laughs> it's more than improving your language proficiency. Um, it's really about learning to reach out and stretch yourself and be stretched have some ups, have downs, learn how to recover from that, and go on. And that is the real strength of this exchange program we have. And I want to thank you again very much for having supported us this year. I, I have a question I just wanted to ask. If this is our second time at doing this French exchange program, with the last one being in 2000, how is it decided each year from year to year which programs are presented for consideration? Um, the past two years, we haven't had one because of world events. Mm -hmm. It was purely world events that did not make it a good climate for organizing trips overseas. And certainly things that happened in the past month in Europe, which would cause people to think twice about whether we want to have our students traveling there. Um, but again, you all um, took a big gulp and made a risk and took a risk and let us go. And I appreciate it very much you're doing that. Um, we, we try to do it as often as there is interest and as often as people are available to um, create such programs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Any you, other Dave. comments or questions for Dia? Yeah, I would just like to say there would be more students here, but they went to the movies and out to dinner, at least a bunch of them did. Um, but I took six of them skiing uh, Wednesday night and Thursday. And I haven't had so much fun. I mean, I, <laughs> I can't tell you how much fun I had with them. Um, and you know, it was funny, on the drive up, they're all speaking French, and I don't speak any French. And um, so I'm just listening to the chatter, have no clue what they're talking about. Hopefully it wasn't me. Um, and uh, then we had a beautiful day of skiing, and three of, out of the six had never skied before. And they had a ball, and were so appreciative. It was, it was really cute to watch them. As we were leaving, they're taking pictures of the mountain, and you know, it was, we had a great time. But I hope that they enjoyed that. So. I think they have, and I think they've enjoyed their visit yeah. very much. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you, David. And now we can move on to the principal's reports, uh, the high school. Jeff? First of all, as he wanders out the building, I want to just mention Patrick Myers. Patrick and I went up to Bangor last weekend? Yeah. It was last weekend. Patrick was the high school's nominee to the, for the Maine Principals Association Award, um, which is not a monetary award, but it's, it's one of the most prestigious awards that principals are, give, are given the opportunity to give out. And principals from across the state come with seniors um, to a very brief luncheon. Um, our luncheon was even a little bit briefer because I had problems remembering where the Bangor s auditorium was or <laughs> civic center was. We did make it there in time for, for lunch. 
And we did make it there in time for the speaker, but I just wanted to mention Patrick that he was, Patrick was the um, uh, main principals association designate, designee for the high school. I want to take advantage of the fact that he was here. <laughs> I just want to touch on a couple of things. Um, we are hot and heavy into putting together a schedule for next year at the high school. Um, I anticipate that a draft of that at least will be done shortly after the April break. Carol Robitelli, um, who's our super scheduler in the guidance office, uh, who is absolutely amazing and manages to get it done every year so that students and teachers can have their schedules before they leave in the sprint, before they leave for the summer vacation, is hard at work on that. Uh, in addition to working on spending a significant amount of time working on the transition to a new administrative software called PowerSchool. Um, so those of you who know Carol, if you happen to be in the office, in the school for any reason, just stop by and just mention to her what a great job she's doing because she truly does a fantastic job and keeps us moving, which is excellent. Uh, the French exchange students are here. I won't really say anything more about that. Our teachers are working uniformly hard uh, on the putting together the draft outlines of reports for our accreditation process, the New England Association of Schools and Colleges. <coughs> uh, at our most recent staff development day, we made some significant progress, each one of the committees, so I'm really pleased with the way that is beginning to come together. We are having some difficulty getting survey results back from Endicott College, uh, who a number of you took the surveys for. They're having some technical glitches at their end, so we're hoping we're gonna get that information in time to be useful to inform the, uh, the study process. And the last, the uh, uh, spring athletic season is beginning. I think the first competitions are this week in all the sports programs, so you'll be hearing more about those. I wanted to mention our girls' swim team, uh, which the other evening was uh, appropriately recognized by the town council for a number of accomplishments. The third straight championship, uh, a class B team winning the class A state championship, which has happened three years in a row. Each year we petition, as we do in soccer and we do in swimming, we petition the MPA to essentially compete up in the next level up. Um, on the team were two academic All-Americans, three main state All-State all academics, four swimming and diving All-Americans, um, and the team as a whole was recognized with, a, with gold level achievement, um, by the Interscholastic Swim Coaches Association for having, as a team as a whole, a GPA of 3.85. So it's a group of people who are accomplishing not only in the water, but accomplishing in the classroom. It's truly impressive. So I wanted to mention that as well. And that's all. Any questions? No questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, the middle school, uh, Nancy. Good evening. First, I think I'd like to just talk for a minute about our play, which we did just finish. It was Evan Solander's um, first time as our play director, and also the first time for Steve Price to pass that mantle on to someone else. Um, they handled all of that transition wonderfully. Um, the play was a great success, and as um, Kevin said, it got better and better as they went through and they went on. So um, that was a wonderful opportunity for them. We are coming to a time, though, where we're finding it more of a challenge to find a musical that's appropriate for middle school and that we can get a number of students in. We have stayed with musicals because part of the goal of our drama program is for students to have a chance to try it out. And maybe they've never done drama before. And so in our cast, you have the people who are real veterans of the Children's Theater of Maine and other things. And for some people, it's the very first time they've done it. So in our first debriefing meeting um, that Evan and I have had since the play, we've been talking about next year we may try a little bit different approach um, and do two plays, one more in the fall part of the year and one in the early spring, and um, have them be a little bit different and hopefully attract two different kinds of, of participants so that um, kids who are involved in sports and athletics and other activities in different ways might be involved in a fall one or they might be involved in the spring um, play. It would also give a chance for students to play more than one role, i.e. if they want to be on the tech part for one play and then be out as a performer on another one. And Evan has come across several resources of 
uh, one act plays that are shorter that are specifically written for middle school students um, that we might use as a resource. So we're still researching that. We know it would be a change. Um, what we have talked about is maybe every other year we do that kind of approach followed by a musical. So as a student who's in the middle school for four years, two times you'll have a chance to be part of the musical, two times you'd have an opportunity for another type of theater performance. For me, the best thing about going to those performances throughout the entire weekend is, as I've said before, it's middle level education at its best. It's students doing their very best work at that moment in time, feeling very good about it, and having a great time at the same time. So that's the purpose of our drama program. We probably will not be on Broadway, but we're going to have a lot of fun um, as we do it. We also have other upcoming events. It's the time of year where the calendar gets very, very busy. But um, between now and the next board meeting, a couple of other invitations to send your way. We do have a fifth and sixth grade band and chorus concert coming up on May 5th. Um, that's a Wednesday night. It's at 7.30. It's in the high school gym. This is the time of year where we absolutely do not fit into our own space, so we need to go to the gym to do that, and this will be the fifth grade band's premiere performance. Um, they are ready to do that activity. The sixth grade band will be performing, and the fifth and sixth grade chorus. We also do that because the next week, our sixth graders will be at Chewankee, so we need to do it the first week in May. It will be followed by the second week in May. We have our um, sixth and seventh, our, pardon me, our seventh and eighth grade band and chorus concerts and seventh grade jazz groups. Our eighth grade jazz groups will be performing as part of the high school jazz cabaret as Terry White and Tom Lazad and Tom's crew of other jazz musicians work on that and they put that on on a Friday evening, I think in a Sunday afternoon. I think it's April 30th and May 2nd. That will be at the high school. <clears throat> as I mentioned, we do have Chewankee coming up and for any sixth grade parents, we've been talking about it through the year, but now it's come, becoming closer and closer. We are all hopeful that the rain is getting out of our system now so that the week of May 10th through the 14th will be wonderful weather uh, with just a little bit of dampness in it because there's always that Chewankee challenge. You don't want to go to Chewankee and have five great days because then all the other Chewankee veterans will tell you you really didn't understand the Chewankee experience. But we just want just a little bit of dampness, not torrential rains. The students will be leaving from the service entrance area right around 8.45 on Monday, May 10th. They will be returning somewhere between 1.15 and 1.30. We don't have a precise time on that, but they do return to the bus loop for those parents who will be picking them up. The Chewankee tuition this year um, per student is $205. We have, with the Middle School Parents Association's assistance and the Student Council's assistance with the magazine sale and the Sally Foster sale, we have got that down so that each family contribution will be $75 per participant. So we feel that the fundraising in Cape Elizabeth has done a really grand job of that. The um, school system also supports the effort and through a donation towards the tuition um, of $2,500 and that really helps out as well too. But a lot of the money has been raised through the whole school's effort of raising money for Chewankee. Several, I think, let's see, I think it was two weeks ago, six of us went to the New England League of Middle Schools conference in Providence, Rhode Island, and I think people in schools are always a little hesitant when a group goes off like that to a conference because they know they're going to come back with an idea that they're going to want them to do. And, of course, we fulfilled that promise. And we came back and we have decided and we've just sort of, sometimes you make decisions in groups like this where you all vote and debate it and other times this is such a terrific idea, we want to put the idea out there as a given and then put our energy towards how will we make it be even greater than we think it will be. And what our idea is as we look at climate and situations and how people respond to one another, treat one another throughout the middle school, we decided that what we'd really like to focus on next year is a lot of relationship building with the broad theory that the more we know each other, the better we know each other, the better we understand each other, then the nicer, and that's simply what it is, the nicer, more respectful, and lighter we will be to one another. So we are going to have the first day of school, the first day of the second trimester, and the first day of the third trimester will be a day that students in fifth and sixth grade will spend entirely in their homerooms with their homeroom teachers. 
Seventh and eighth grade students will spend the day in their advisory groups with their advisors. The purpose of the day is that at the end of the day, we will know a lot more about each other than we did at the start of the day. Of course, that first day of school, it will be getting to know the group, coming to form as a group. As we get into the year with the second and the third trimester days, we'll be doing some revisiting of some goals that we've had for seventh grade groups. It will be a great time to revisit the Kiev experience. For the eighth grade groups, they'll be revisiting how they worked on their community service project in the fall and doing that and then planning for the spring and planning transitions. And we've done a lot of reading and studying in the middle school about bullying, about treating each other in a kinder and a gentler, more respectful way. And we know there are lots of programs out there that you can buy, like bully free zones and things like that. The problem with them is that everybody learns how to do it when they're outside of the zone or when you're not watching. And we know our problem areas in the middle school are the hallways, the lunchroom, and recess and locker rooms. And what we're trying to do is build a climate of respect so that We'll watch out for one another and make sure that what comes out of our mouth are things that are appropriate and not things that are inappropriate. So um, we'll keep you updated on that throughout the year. I think it will be a slow, gradual change, but we want to show the students that this is in, the climate of the building is important enough to us that we're going to take serious time to work on it, to revise it, to revisit it, and to make it a better place to be. With that, any questions? This is a little off the topic, but do you have a, a date for Kiev next year? Yes, it's the, now we talked, is it October, whatever the Monday is, I'm going to say October 4th mm -hmm. through the 7th. Okay. That's a Monday through a Friday. Okay. Okay. Thanks. I had a, a couple comments. Um, first, I just wanted to say that I went to Bye Bye Birdie, and I thought it was great. And I just want to say thank you to the middle school staff, especially Evan Solander and all the kids who participated, because it's a, I'm sure it's a huge endeavor to pull all that together. Um, but secondly, I, I, I'm really interested in the idea of what you plan to do with the first day of each trimester, and I'll be interested to hear how that goes um, next year. I think it's a great experiment. I, and I'm hoping that, um, you know, as it goes on, that some of our student reporters will also report to you from the student point of view, which will be different than the adult point of view. Um, but that's part of what the whole activity is about. How can we all come at this a little bit differently and um, just work together, like I said, to make it a better place. So we will keep you updated. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Um, Pine Cove, Tom? Good evening. I'd, I'd like to start with a few numbers tonight for some reason. Um, you're probably aware that we just completed the spring cycle for the parent-teacher conferences. And you're also aware we have a student population of about 640 kids. And by our my quick survey of the teachers, we had almost 100% attendance at the uh, conferences, which I think is amazing. In fact, in some cases, since teachers are willing to accommodate family differences, there were more conferences than kids in some classes. Again, by the numbers, um, these are 20-minute conferences. That's over 215 hours of serious contact, K through four. And when you add in the time that teachers spend preparing for the conferences and the thoughtful participation of the parents before, during, and after the conferences, I think it's a remarkable achievement. It's one of the strengths of the school. And I just want to acknowledge all the hard work people have done to make that work. A little different numbers category. I just got my report for the uh, statewide uh, results of reading recovery statewide across Maine. You may know that we, we have participated for years as a reading recovery school, and uh, there, it's kind of a data-driven group. The report shows that the, uh, we are achieving about a 75% success rate with these students. Reading recovery takes on the first grade students who are having difficulty reading. They meet with a reading recovery teacher, specially trained, specially qualified, 30 minutes a day for 12 to 20 weeks. And at the end of that time, the goal is that they will reach at least the average achievement level of our first grade. Uh, depending on what time of the year it is, uh, the goals change. Um, three quarters success is pretty good, considering the other 25% would include kids moving or a change in placement or so on. Uh, not that these professionals would just rest on their laurels. It's a, 
Becky Swift, Deborah Jordan Pearson, and Suzanne Hamilton. I, I think are probably the best, three best reading recovery the teachers, we are, uh, reading recovery teachers in the state. They look at this data and even try harder to improve the success rate, not just with their instruction, but by working very closely with the uh, first grade teachers. Um, and further good news on the numbers on this, this is your No Child Left Behind money at work. This reading recovery qualifies under the federal program for support and we pay the um, salaries of the three reading recovery teachers that way. It's a great program and I probably should report to you more frequently on it. And if you have any questions about it, maybe we could do a special on it some night. It's just a terrific program. Uh, continuing with the numbers, but this is more under the category of be careful what you ask for because you might get it. Uh, outside of reading recovery, which is uh, numbers driven and very good that way, we've had a hard time gathering and maintaining our assessment data with the other assess reading assessments we do, with the uh, developmental reading assessment and other things. Um, in a casual conversation with high school math teacher Roger Rio early this fall, Roger agreed to take this on. We, we masked the data and he submitted our reading data to his AP stats course, which at the time I thought was a great idea. They, uh, since we hid the, you know, the identifying characteristics, they went through and they generated tables for us. As a matter of fact, not just tables, bar charts, histograms, box plots, and so on. So we have more than enough. Our problem is we're not quite sure what to do with it. And if um, Roger is watching or hears about this, I'm sure he'll follow up. It's great data, and I, I thank the high school for getting involved, but it shows our lack of sophistication for dealing with this. Other ongoing activities upon COVE, just to um, mention them again, we, Kelly and, uh, Hassan and I reported to you about the teacher leader model and our efforts to um, um, work with teachers and to further define the model. We're, we're still making progress in that area and I may have neglected to mention too that Kelly also works with parents. So we have a, a project going on with the phonics material and instruction in grades K1 and 2 and Kelly at the request of the teachers has recruited uh, an energetic cadre of parents to help prepare the materials that's used in the classroom, helping not only the teachers get these lessons done, but learning a lot about our approach to teaching reading in those grades. And again, the shared credit goes to Kelly, the parents, and for the teachers in grades K1 and 2, it's over half the teachers who are piloting this program. Uh, more about teacher leadership. Um, this, we just, we're in the middle of another cycle of lesson study and we've made some advances in technology to make it even more powerful. Our media center at Tech, Tracy Green Greenwood, has learned how to tape and to edit the lessons and the debriefings and put them on a DVD. So even if you weren't there, we can go back and look at the lesson, or even the people who were there, to review and get uh, improve our instruction even more. So thank you, Tracy. And speaking of thank yous, uh, Kevin Sweeney came to our faculty meeting last week to update the whole staff on, you, on the uh, superintendent search. I think this personal contact goes a long way, and Kevin, thank you, and I think you'll agree it's a lot better than email. My pleasure. Yeah. Questions? None. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Yep. Now we'll move on to committee reports. Uh, the Finance Committee, Elaine. <clears throat> yes, um, the Finance uh, Committee uh, met prior to this evening's uh, regular, reg regular meeting. Uh, we did sign some warrants and reviewed the appropriation reports. Um, the rest of the meeting uh, did take a look at uh, our upcoming budget presentation for tomorrow evening with the Town Council. Um, in the interest of the public that's watching this evening but may not uh, watch the budget presentation tomorrow. I just wanted to give a small recap regarding the process that has brought us to this point. Um, starting in December and, well, as early as October, I know we had district leadership team uh, under Tom's leadership uh, to start addressing the budgets and developing priorities at each school or each department. Um, we really started working with the town council uh, at some point in December and very early January, whether it be uh, just the finance chairs meeting together or it be the whole school board and town council in a workshop setting to discuss again the priorities uh, from each side of uh, the uh, town municipal budget and the school budget. Um, on January 22nd, the town council held a, a goal target setting workshop uh, regarding the total budget development. 
at that time the school was still in the process of developing the individual schools budgets and we did have some preliminary set costs that we were able to share with them at that time we shared with them that we had contracted salary increases of three point three percent we had contracted benefits increases of one point three percent we had the voter approved building project debt for next year of two point seven percent and then we had also estimated uh, our special ed costs of 0.3%. Uh, these increases represented a 7.6 increase. We shared that our budget was not finalized, but that there were further needs for monies to address our federal and state mandates. Uh, we had enrollment issues that still needed to be uh, critiqued. We had uh, another potentially uh, 5% that would be possible added on to that figure. But in the end, the town council um, agreed that their goal for the school department at that time would be a target of no more than 8.1% increase over the 0304 budget. It was a goal, and in that spirit, we set out to develop a budget that would best meet the needs of all of our students in Cape Elizabeth, and that we would strive to hit that 8.1% budget increase. Unfortunately, that goal really only left us with $76,000 to address, as I said, the increased enrollments, um, the increases in fixed costs such as uh, oil increases, electricity, contracted services, and a variety of insurances, and then also cover the federal and state mandates such as the Main State Learning Results and the No Child Left Behind Act. Um, the school board and the administrators had since that time eliminated over $400,000 or another 2.7% of the original proposals of, that we had in our original budget back in February. The proposed budget that Town Council will hear tomorrow is requesting a 9.8% increase. I am impressed with the creative plans to address these issues with only a 2.2% increase. Based on our most recent school board workshop, I have every reason to believe that the rest of the school board feels the same way and will be supporting this budget in formal action this evening. Um, Town Council, again, will hear our budget tomorrow evening, Wednesday, April 14th. It is supposed to be televised. Um, we have had to move the meeting over to the Community Services Building because of the uh, declining temperature in here. <laughs> And um, I'm hoping that it's still going to be televised. If not uh, live, it would be delayed. Um, the six-year average school budget increase for Cape Elizabeth has been only 3.6% per year. And this is well below all of the surrounding communities in the Cumberland County. Our per-pupil expenditures have continued to decline. In 1995, we were number two when you compared us with the 12 other school districts. And in 2002, we're number eight. And I believe that updated figures will bring us even further down in that list of 12 communities. Our teachers' salaries and their benefits are responsible. Our research shows that we are right in the middle of the surrounding communities as far as benefits and salaries. I um, would encourage people to look and out for the upcoming uh, mail, and we'll be receiving the school department newspaper with a lot of budget information, and it's called The View. But I think you'll find that information very enlightening, and if you had any questions regarding the budget, I hope you would contact any of the school board members or the superintendent. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Elaine. Um, the policy committee, Anne? The Policy Committee met on April 6th. Um, at that meeting, we had invited Ann Chapman of Drummond Woodsum our, um, with our legal counsel to attend for a couple of different reasons. The first was we had um, asked our legal counsel to help us in drafting two policies that we've been working on the past several months, our conflict of interest policy and our nepotism policy. Um, I really won't go into those in detail because those are going to be presented later on this evening. Um, but the one thing I just wanted to comment on that Anne did say regarding those two policies is that although many schools still have 
the similar kind of policy that we have that we're acting under right now for those two policies. Several are starting to work towards revising their conflict of interest and nepotism policies and are moving in the same direction that we've been considering moving in terms of refining them further and defining certain aspects of those policies. Um, the second thing that Anne presented us with was, you might remember several months ago, we decided to ask Drummond Woodson to do a complete review of our policy manual and came to present that review. Um, and gave, gave us quite detailed written information, but a couple of points that I'd like to share. Um, first of all, every single policy in our manual now has a note from, from Drummond Woodson in regard to something that we need to address, something that's left out, or something that we perhaps need to update. And if you've ever seen the policy manual, it's quite large, so we have um, a lot of work to do. Um, there are many old policies in our manual that are really no longer pertinent that the committee is going to have to look at uh, removing. Um, we do actually have most required policies um, going by state statutes that we need to have, but many of those are out of date. And finally, they've presented a list of priorities, policies that they feel really should deserve priority status that will help us when we start putting together our work plan for next year's committee. Um, and that covered the policy manual. Um, finally, we asked her a couple of additional things just to give input and comment on since she was she was at our meeting one of which was how policies are brought to the committee this past year we've had a couple of parents raise some policy issues as well as a school board member and um, basically it's up to each individual um, policy committee within each school board in terms of how they function but she felt that it was important to Primarily stick to the work plan that your committee has outlined for the year unless there's something that's really pressing or an emergency that the committee could then decide to slip in um, and work on somewhere within that year's work plan. So that was helpful to hear. Um, I also raised the issue of protocol for visitors at policy committee meetings just because we've had so many visitors attend our meetings this year, which I think is great. It shows community interest and people bring all kinds of different um, questions and offer good input at the meetings. Um, again, it's the kind of thing that is really up to individual committees, but we all feel strongly that we certainly like to, all of our meetings of course are open, but that we want to encourage participation on the part of guests and we'll always offer the opportunity for input understanding that we do have a lot of work to do. Those are working committees. Um, we have limited amount of time to get that work done, but we always want to welcome input and thoughts from the community at those policy committee meetings. And then finally, we discussed um, the policy that we first presented last month in terms of awarding high school credit prior to grade nine, and we'll be presenting that later this evening for uh, discussion and vote. Okay, thank you, Ann. Um, and I guess you can continue with the communication committee. Okay, our communication um, committee actually did its work this past month via email. It was difficult getting all of our members together. Um, we, last month, a couple months ago, we presented some of the thoughts and ideas that we had for enhancing communication to and from the school board. Um, those are not going to be, I don't really, I'm not going to present them again tonight, but what, what we're going to do with those ideas is Tom has offered to present them to the district leadership team to get their input and ideas on how, how well they'll really work for, for the school and for the school board. And then at that point, after those are presented to the DLT, they'll come back to the board, and at that time, we'll put together a list of those recommendations that the board will then vote on for next year's um, action. Okay. Thank you. Building committee. Elaine? Um, yes, the, the building committee met last Wednesday, April 7th. Um, 
there was a discussion of the preparation for the upcoming planning board meeting on april twenty ninth there is a resolution from town council expressing support for the recommended solutions to the failing intersection in front of the high school on route seventy seven i think as most of us remember the planning board had some concerns over how we were going to address that issue they were looking for direction from both the school board and the town council so at that point we needed to get together and come up with some sort of action plan as to whether we were going to follow up on the variety of traffic studies that we had all been presented with addressing the issues the actual draft motion that the town council approved i'm going to read because i don't think we've all seen this and i just wanted to share with you that this will go before the planning board the cape elizabeth town council hereby approves an application to pacts for a new traffic signal and related improvements engineers estimated cost of one hundred sixty eight thousand at the intersection of ocean house road and the entrance to elizabeth cape elizabeth high school if the project is approved by pacts and is included in the biennial transportation improvement program the local share shall be allocated from the town roadway drainage improvement account if the project is not approved in the next pacts btip the cost of the traffic light and other improvements shall be bonded as an amendment to the calendar year two thousand five school bond with the cost to be repaid through the municipal budget over the succeeding five years a formal resolution authorizing the bond amendment is to be approved by the town council prior to the bond issuance or and there are several scenarios in which they're discussing you know the funding of this light and um, uh, roadway improvements the other proposal goes on to continue if the school project should receive bids under budget and the entire project is under budget the town council would look favorably upon a recommendation from the school building committee recommending that the signal and other improvements be paid for in total or in part through unspent allocations within the school bond if this latter option occurs the portion of the cost of the light and other improvements shall be incorporated into the bonds previously authorized and the amortization of the cost shall be in the school budget any amount bonded in excess of the original authorization shall be amortized amortized for a period of not more than five years and shall be repaid through appropriations in the municipal budget if the citizens of the state of maine should approve any limitation upon communities to levy taxes or to authorize bonds this vote shall be automatically revoked and the town council will consider options available to cape elizabeth um, so this is what will go forth along with our school board letter um, recommending resolution uh, and addressing the issue the safety issue and they will um, then act on deciding whether to approve our building projects on april 29th anyone have any questions about the town council motion Um, the building committee also um, had an update on the upcoming dates from HKTA, who is the architect, um, such as the DE approval dates, site walks by contractors, the filed sub bids. Uh, on May 11th at 3 o'clock, there will be an opening of the bids for the Pond Cove project. Our patent contract has come back from the attorneys and was passed along to town council uh, uh, yes, yesterday evening. At last night's meeting, the town council tabled um, the contract for further questions, which we will be addressing tomorrow evening prior to our budget presentation. Uh, the building committee also has been reviewing the plans at the high school and fine-tuning and meeting with the school department uh, for their input. Peyton is ready to start their estimating, and all indications at this point show that we are still on target in regards to the timeline and with our costs. Um, we did have some discussion regarding the separating of some components of the project outside of the scope of the construction management firm, such as the track uh, resurfacing or some of the roof work at the school. 
um, it was decided uh, by the building committee to explore possible cost savings or timing advantages uh, by pursuing that uh, issue. There were some concerns over potential problems in the IT wing with air quality and safety, air exchange systems in the auditorium. Uh, also, the adaptability of the class physical size if it, we were be, to be asked to deal with the potential consequences of the Pulaski Initiative. Um, and there were also questions regarding the long-term appropriateness of the darkroom for the photography art class. And these are some issues that uh, we will bring up at our next meeting once we have a little uh, more information. Um, our next meeting will be May 13th, uh, which is a Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock. <coughs> oh, excuse me, Elaine. Um, did you, you said the town council tabled last night a vote approving the contract the school board has with the construction manager. Is that correct? Yes. Why is the town council even voting on a contract between the school board and the construction manager? The town council, and Tom, if you can help this me was with a, this. This was a decision that was made early on in the building committee. It's done different ways. Um, and there are some communities where um, the school board, you know, makes that call and enters into the into the contract um, but early on in the building committee um, it was determined that both bodies would approve the, um, the contract the building committee decided mm -hmm. the building committee is a town appointed committee Thanks. you have for instance the other thing you have the, the school board has done in the past and on the agenda this evening is to approve the um, contract for the architect, um, which is something you've already done for, for, for the Pond Cove project. And, and then we have the architect's contract for the um, high school project. And in the past, um, even with our, when we've hired architects, like when we did SMRT for the feasibility study, that was always something that was in the, under the jurisdiction of the, um, of the school board. Um, but with, and it's a major cost, and I think that's probably the, the, the main reason um, as far as the construction firm that handles the project. I think we'll have a, a similar situation with the awarding of the bid for Pond Cove. Could be a different firm. Mm -hmm. But we are, we, on May 11th, when we open the bids for Pond Cove, we are at that point obligated to take the lowest bidder. Right. Mm -hmm. So for the Pond Cove project. Elaine, just a vote, uh, a note of clarification. The next building committee meeting is Thursday, May 16th. Oh, is it the 16th? I'm sorry. Thank you. That yeah, I'm on. Okay. Um, the superintendent search committee. Um, as I reported last month, um, the school board had decided to form a subcommittee um, for the superintendent's search, which is myself, Kevin, Ann, and um, Kathy. And I would like to update you on what we have done um, since our last school board meeting. We uh, have decided that the only print media um, that we were using for advertising was in Education Week, um, a trade magazine. And um, we had placed one ad March t that appeared March 24th and another ad in the April 7th edition. All of the other advertising that we have been doing has been on various websites and in um, newsletters. Uh, we, we have been informed um, through NESDEC that um, thus far we have had um, over 30 inquiries um, from around the country um, for our superintendent search. Some of them are completed applications. <coughs> um, we will have 
all completed applications to the superintendent's office here by Monday, uh, April 26th. And on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, the 26th, 27th, and 28th, all school board members will be screening those applications. May 4th and May, <coughs> wait a minute, I think I have May 4th, thank you. May 4th and May 6th are the two dates um, that we have set aside at this point for um, the semi-finalist interviews. We are also holding Saturday, May 15th, um, as an interview date for any out-of-state candidates. Um, we had... Um, we have already sent letters to all superintendents and assistant superintendents in the state of Maine. And um, we have asked community members to be part of our interview team. We had requested that um, they send in letters to the school board. Last <coughs> Friday, um, we, we, actually, we, we actually received quite a few letters, and last Friday we, to, we chose two community members, Jim Walsh and M.A. Watson, to be part of a 16-member um, interview team for the superintendent candidates. Um, as I reported last month, each of our three principals are on that committee, um, so was Claire Labrie, however, she is unable um, to be part of the interviews. She has a previous commitment. Sarah Simmons um, will be substituting for her. The three teachers that are on the committee are Shari Robinson from Pond Cove, Margaret Welch from the middle school, and Dwight Ely from um, the high school. The, uh, we would like to, the school board would like to hold uh, a preliminary meeting with the entire interview team to discuss the process that we will follow for the interviews and the roles of each member of the interview team. And that meeting will be on May 3rd at 3.15 um, at the middle school. We have also asked that um, each school, the faculty of each of our three schools, um, to submit to us not more than three questions that they would like asked during this interview process. Um, and we will um, either use them for the semi-finalist interviews or the finalist interviews, but, but we would like that information um, by April 28th if that's possible, from the three schools. Um, the next piece of information that um, is important to the school board is um, that we would like to, on, on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, the 26th, 27th, and 28th, school board will be screening the applications. That afternoon, Wednesday afternoon on the 28th, we will have our first meeting um, to decide on the, the semifinalists that we will then interview that first week in May. Um, so if all school board members could be at that meeting, that would be, that would be great. Um, and that's it, unless Kevin, do uh, you have something to add? Just, just quickly, um, I saw some puzzled looks. Um, if the principals could stay for five minutes, at the end of the meeting, I will put your puzzlement aside. The three questions. Okay. Um, any other comments from Kathy or uh, Ann? Anything that I've forgotten? I don't think so. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, and next, we can move on to um, unfinished business. And tonight... Um, we are. Uh, we we would like to have approval um, of uh, to adopt our school budget. Um, tomorrow night is the presentation to in a workshop to the town council, and we need a motion to adopt our budget of sixteen million eight hundred and twenty-two thousand four hundred and seven dollars. 
Kevin? So moved. Ms. Second? Jennifer? Um, are there any comments or questions? Okay, all those in favor? Six, zero. Thank you. Um, and next we have um, several policies for second reading. Ian? Okay. Um, we have three policies tonight for second reading. It, the board conflict of interest, the nepotism policy, and awarding high school credit prior to grade nine policy. Um, but before I get into discussing these in detail, I just thought I would give an historical perspective on the first two that we're going to be discussing, the conflict of interest and nepotism policies. I thought it might be helpful to people watching who haven't been following the work of the policy committee over the past several months when we've been working on this. Um, the policy committee has been queried as to why we're working hard and have spent so much time revising these two policies at this particular time and with this particular board. And the answer to that is that over the past several years, there have been several issues that have raised concerns in regard to both of these policies. Specifically, several years ago, there was um, there was an, an issue with a board member in regards to the conflict of interest policy. There have also been issues over the past couple of years in regards to administrators hiring relatives. Based on some of those things that have happened over the past several years, we thought that it was time to take another look, as you should always look at all your policies, at these particular two. Um, so in September of this, this current school year, our very, at our very first policy committee meeting, we developed our work plan based on what we felt were priorities and also taking into account what had been um, previously discussed but not really formally worked on from last year. At that point in September, we put the conflict of interest and nepotism policies on our priority work plan for the current year. At the October and November policy committee meetings, we took our first stab at rewriting both of those policies and came up with several revisions for them. These were presented at the November 12th, 2003 regular school board meeting. After much discussion at that meeting, it was sent back to the committee for further work. At this point, we asked our legal counsel, Drummond Woodson, to review our drafts and help us in developing revisions which they did and sent us back the following month with a uh, revised and combined policy, putting the two policies together, um, which we presented at the December 9th meeting for first reading. Again, after a great deal of discussion at that meeting, the policy was sent back again to the policy committee for further work, consideration, and revision. After that, um, January through March, our committee grappled with several of the issues within both those policies. And at that point, it became, a couple of things became clear. The first was that a central issue um, regarding the nepotism policy was whether or not to broaden restrictions to extended family members as well as immediate family members. It also became clear at that time that there was not going to be a consensus in terms of a policy to present at, at the next board meeting. And so what our, what our policy committee decided was that we would present three different options around, those, around that issue of extended versus immediate family, which we did so at our March 9th last month school board meeting. Um, the outcome of that was that the majority, although not unanimous, but the majority of the school board members presented, uh, 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 supported that one of the options, what, which was to in fact extend um, some of the restrictions to extended family members as well as immediate family members. There was also a request to send the policies to our legal counsel for review and consideration and input and to ensure that what we wanted to finally present was within the legal boundaries and followed all state statutes retaining, pertaining to those two policies. So what we're presenting tonight is um, 
two different policies, one for conflict of interest, two separate policies, one for nepotism, which were drafted by our legal counsel, which um, were then presented to the policy committee last week. And they incorporate all the elements that we have discussed, as well as the option that we all, um, that the majority of us agreed on at our last board meeting. Both of the policies meet all the legal requirements for the state statutes, according to Bruce Smith, our legal counsel. So with that, I'd like us to first turn our attention to the board member conflict of interest policy. And I'm assuming that most of you have had the chance to read that. What we have here is actually our current policy with everything crossed out that is that we're wanting to not have in here and everything in italics that would be new for this policy. And I'm assuming the notes are not part of the policy. Right. Correct. Those will be taken out. So I... Excuse me, Ann. Mm -hmm. Are we treating this as a second reading? This is, right, this is a second reading. And so I guess at this point, what I need is need a, motion. A, motion. a motion to accept this policy as presented. Kevin? I move that we adopt the nepotism policy, BCC, as presented to the board this evening. No, no, she's working on conflict of interest. Oops, sorry, that's right, that's the wrong one. Um, I move that we adopt the uh, board member conflict of interest file BCB as presented to the board this evening. Is there a second? So is there some discussion or questions on this? Yes, I have a discussion. Ethy? I have discussion actually on both policies, so I'll start um, by um, my discussion now and then it'll cover both. Um, I have an absolutely different take to the uh, nepotism policy, specifically the exclusion from employment of extended family of school board members within the school system. Extended family in the policy is defined as grandparents, grandchildren, uncles, aunts, nieces, nephews, and in-laws. Although there is an exception clause as of the date of policy adoption to prevent employment termination of immediate and extended family members of school board members, if this policy is adopted, it will prevent board members from having extended family members as employees of the school system in the future. Deterring potential applicants from applying for employment with the largest employer in the town concerns me as Cape Elizabeth is a small town that currently has multiple family members employed in the school system, including community services. As I mentioned at last month's meeting, my objections are based on the following. Main Statute Title 20A, Section 1002, only excludes spouses of school board members from employment in the school system. Main School Management Suggested Policy only excludes spouses and immediate family of school board members from employment in the schools. Immediate family members are defined as spouse, brother, sister, parent, son, or daughter. Main school law for board members written by Drummond and Woodsum defines prohibitions as follows. Quote, several statutory provisions address the subject of conflicts of interest on the part of school board members. By statute, a school board member or the spouse of a school board member may not be an employee in a public school within the jurisdiction of the school board to which the member is elected, end quote. It does not go on to include immediate or extended family members. The responsibility of and for boards and commissions meeting conducted by the town and Thomas Leahy, the town's attorney, that I attended on December 8, 2003, gave a list of board members' responsibilities. On that list was an item that indicated that board members should, quote, reveal any potential conflict of interest to the staff member and board chairman prior to discussion and voting on the issue. Board members shall abstain from discussion and voting on any item deemed to be a conflict of interest, end quote. The November 12, 2003 suggested nepotism policy 
and the December 9, 2003 combined conflict of interest and nepotism suggested policy brought before the school board did not exclude extended family members from employment in the school system. This policy draft before us today, dated April 6, 2004, does exclude extended family members from school system employment. The following schools' nepotism and conflict of interest policies include only spouses of school board members as prohibited from employment. Falmouth, Westbrook, Scarborough, and South Portland. I am concerned that we are spending time on unproductive issues like this and not school business. In my five months on the board, this policy change has been consistently on the front burner, and I take this as a personal affront on myself and my family. I find the timing of the introduction of these policy changes, November 12, 2003, ironic and suspicious as that date coincides with my first day on the board. When it was verbally indicated to me that the policy change had been discussed for several months, I reviewed the minutes of the school board meetings for the last two years and found no reference to this policy at all, although I did find reference to many other policies. I feel this proposed change is an attempt to disenfranchise the desire of the voters in the last election. As school board members, we are elected by the citizens of Cape Elizabeth to serve on the board. If I have a conflict, I will recuse myself from voting, as I did earlier this evening. I have requested three times from the school board and not received a written legal opinion from the school board's attorney with legal advice about explaining the definition of the conflict of interest nepotism policy, excuse me, about expanding the definition of the conflict of interest nepotism policy. I find this rather curious and wonder if there's a reason why an opinion has not been obtained. I am not clear on the intent of this policy. I find the apparent assumption of the nepotism policy that school board members will not conduct themselves professionally curious. It is clear to me that the adoption of this policy will interfere with my duties as an elected school board member. Should I choose to run for school board again in the future, I believe this policy could prevent me from serving, as my extended family members have been longtime employees of this school system and I expect will continue. I have spoken with the town manager, and if the school board is unwilling to obtain a legal opinion, the town manager has indicated that the town will get a legal opinion from the town's attorney based on the potential interference with an elected school board member's performance of official duties. Just to, to, to clarify, um, the policy as, as presented um, does say that um, board members uh, shall not be employed, uh, members, members of the family may not be employed subject to the following exemptions. And that is to say that if, if there are immediate or extended family members employed in the district, it does not prevent anyone from running for school board. The only thing this policy does is to prevent someone on the school board hiring while they're on the school board hiring a member of their family. It does not prevent um, members of the family from being employed, and it doesn't even say that you can't run for school board, uh, because there are three exceptions that says immediate and extended family members except spouses who are employed as of the date of this policy it shall be able to stay in those positions, and it also says that this does not prevent someone from running for school board who has members of their family um, uh, working in a school district. The only thing, and the reality of it is the only thing it does do is to prevent, because you, school board members, you do um, act on the hiring of all employees, of hiring new members or new employees. Um, it doesn't have any impact on present employees or employees that were here when you're elected to the board. The one thing that we cannot do legally is refuse to let someone sit on the board. Right. That's why those we exceptions are there. Right. right. And as far as the legal opinion that, we're, that we, we can do that, but as with all um, you know, issues that are, whenever we seek legal counsel, um, it's at the request of the board and not, of, as, not from an individual board member that, that the board so chooses to get more um, information from our legal counsel. I spoke to Bruce Smith today about this. He's more than willing to do that and would explain, um, I guess, in greater depth what this means. Um.
but it's a direct explanation to me that is is that it's perfectly legal in what we're doing obviously where they wouldn't have given it to us otherwise but he would expand on that if the board so desire are there other comments pertaining to the first policy which is the conflict of interest policy which is what's now on the table So, okay. All in favor of this policy as presented? The conflict of interest. Policy. Conflict of interest. Opposed? Six to one. Five to one. Okay, then moving on to the second policy, which is nepotism. I, I have a. Uh, I would like to respond to something. I don't know if it's appropriate or not, um, whether to do it privately or um, it, it, publicly. Is it on the policy that we just took a vote on? It, it's uh, in reference to um, Kathy's comment. Go ahead if you think it's apropos. Um, I, I would just like to say that I've been on the policy committee for six years. This is not directed toward you. Uh, we don't tend to discuss policies that we're working on or talking about in the policy committee at the board meetings. So the fact that you may not have found reference to it um, is not necessarily indicative of whether or not it's been spoken about in the policy committee, if it hasn't been spoken of in a public meeting. Um, if you, this originally arose with me, uh, with a member of the school board many years ago in which many of us publicly asked this person to recuse himself from certain discussions and he would not do that. That's where this sort of originated many years ago. Um, it was reinforced probably three years ago and it's been one of those things we talk about and talk about and it just never got on there. I would wager, although I couldn't recollect whether or not it was on, last year we were very well organized with Sue Steinman with a list of what policies were sort of on our agenda. It may very well be on there. I'm not 100% sure, but you may want to look there just for your own personal um, satisfaction. Um, but, as I said, uh, these were things that I, as a member of the policy committee, have talked about for years. So, um, anyway. Thank you. Thanks for those comments, Jen. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now moving on to the nepotism policy. Again, this is our, what's presented is the, our current policy with uh, lines crossed off that we're removing and the italics represent the new revised version that we'd like to present tonight. What this does is, um, for people in the audience who are not looking at it, is it provides some definitions that we did not have in our, in our previous policy, definitions such as for employee, administrators, supervisors, and immediate family and extended family. It also is just a lot clearer in terms of um, specific people, I mean, not, not people, but specific positions such as the superintendent, administrators, um, so that we can really much more easily understand what the policy is trying to help us define. And I'd really like to say that the purpose of these policies is to be helpful and to clarify and to minimize potential conflicts. It's not to restrict. And I think that that's the spirit. People need to understand that that's the spirit in which these policies are presented here tonight. I'd also like to point out that number five on the second page is exceptions to the policy. We have provided for exceptions, and I would just like to read it. 
the board may approve an exception to this policy except for the statutory prohibition against employment of board member spouses if there is a determination that it is in the best interest of the school department and appropriate measures can be taken to avoid conflict it is the intent of the board that this provision be narrowly construed and used only in rare circumstances Okay, so with that, I'd like a motion to accept this nepotism policy as presented tonight. Kevin? I move that we adopt the nepotism policy file BCC as presented to the board with the caveat that this policy be re formally reviewed one year from its date of adoption to determine whether or not its impact, it has had a negative impact on any board member. Is there a second? Is that, has that become part of the motion? You know, I don't, actually, I should have mentioned that was one of the things that we had, what, adjustment to the motion? No, you can do that. That's the motion. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That was one of the things that we had actually talked about that I neglected to, to mention, that we had, said that we'd like for the policy committee to put this on the agenda for a year from now to in fact do what Kevin just suggested. So does that need to be an amendment to that? No, that's how we've made his motion. No, okay. I, I guess I would okay. expand the caveat to see if it has any effect too on applications or, you know, people trying to be hired more so than the effect on. Well, if, it's, if his motion is to review it, I think that would be part right. of it. I, I, with, I withdraw the motion and restate it um, that we adopt the policy on nepotism file BCC as presented to the board tonight with the caveat that it be reviewed one year from date of adoption for any negative impact. Okay. Is there a second? We need a second. We need a second. I'll second. Elaine. Discussion? Um, I, I, I wanted to ask a few questions or discussion <coughs> about Kathy's request for um, council to look at it. I'm not really clear as to what advantage or disadvantage and if the town council is going to go forth with this independent of school board action, uh, whether this is something that we need to discuss. Um, can I sure. say some? Um, we need to understand that, that any information that we are given by Drummond and Woodson is, is given to us um, with terms that they are giving us legal information and legal advice. And they have been involved in this um, from the very beginning. I, I think we actually asked them for the very first draft that they mm -hmm. did for us. So along the way in developing all of these policies, we have had legal advice. And um, last month with Ann Chapman at the policy committee meeting, um, you know, she was there representing um, Ruth Smith, so. But I think is the question though, um, that Kathy, you're asking, is whether or not this policy would impede a board member from doing their job. Yes, and also in terms of um, employment of extended family members in the school system, I don't agree. Um, I think that that's casting, um, casting the web out too far, and, um, and I would like to see the um, attorney's opinion with reference to, specifically to the expansion of that policy to include extended family members. Except Drummond and Woodson wrote this. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Is there any more comments or discussion? Elaine, does that satisfy your yes. question? Yes. Thank you for the clarification. Marie. Okay. No, I, I would only say that um, you know it. I I, I guess I, I mean I don't. I don't see a need for going forward and, and further asking uh, Drummond and Woodson to give us legal advice on something that we have already done. But that's not, that's not uh, part of the motion. 
No, it's not, not part of the motion. It was part of the discussion. It was part of right. the discussion, okay. yeah, and it was right. part of the question. So I, so I guess I'm just responding to that. Okay. Any other discussion? All in favor of the motion? Opposed? Thank you. Okay, finally, the last policy that we're presenting tonight for second reading, this was presented last month, awarding of high school course credit prior to grade nine. Um, this is exactly the same policy that we presented for first reading last month. What's in bold is what we also presented last month, which is just adding to our current policy, which states, for the purposes of this policy, a student becomes a high school student when he or she begins taking courses during the fall of the freshman year. Just to give a little bit of background information, this was a, a policy that a parent came to the committee and asked that we review um, and was concerned that his son would not be able to receive high school credit for summer courses that would be taken during this summer. Um, his, school's, his son's currently in eighth grade and felt that number one, high school credit should be awarded for these kinds of programs that are attended. Um, and he felt that even though his son was only in eighth grade, he should be considered for, for high school credit. After a lot of discussion at our policy committee meeting, the parents came also to our policy committee as well as speaking at our last board meeting, some of you might remember. Um, we felt that, first of all, we're held to state guidelines in terms of awarding high school credit when it, not until a student is in high school. On top of that, Jeff um, helped us to understand that there were some broader issues to consider in terms of we would probably be inundated with requests from students for additional high school credit for courses taken outside of the school. For students who have really moved beyond the courses that are currently offered in our high school, they are allowed to take those courses and receive high school credit with prior written permission. So the policy that we're presenting is Really, it's the same policy that, that we have with that one additional clarification of when a student actually becomes a, a ninth grader, which is at the start of ninth grade. So with that, do I have a motion to accept this policy, Kevin? I move that we adopt a policy awarding of high school course credit prior to grade nine, file IKFC, uh, as presented to the board. Is there a second? I'll second it. Any discussion or comments? Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I think I, I just want to make this clear to people who may be watching at home, because I know this is near and dear to some folks. Um, and it's my understanding that by state law, middle school students cannot receive high school credit. Is that correct? That okay. is. OK. So therefore, we're the addition of this line states when you're no longer a middle school student. That's right. Okay. Any other comments or clarifications? All in favor of the motion? Opposed? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ann. Um, the next topic on our list is discussion of laptop issues. Um, and I would, um, I would first ask Tom to uh, give us all an update on, on where we are in the conversations with the state at this point. But the purpose of this discussion amongst the school board is um, to understand where individual school board members feel so that we can kind of get a sense of the direction that the school board um, wants to take on the laptop issue um, if, in fact, there were no support um, from the state. Well, I mean, as, as I mean, I know what I've read in the paper, and I, there was a discussion at a recent um, uh, Cumberland County Superintendent's meeting. Um, and the most recent news is, is that the, the laptops are not part of, the, of the, the budget that's being presented, but will be a standalone um, 
a separate entity that will go to the legislature and the money is still supposedly going to come from the revolving renovation fund. Um, so I, it's, it's a big unknown. And what the school board needs to at least, um, and I guess it will be impacted by um, how the town council deals with our budget. Um, but if we do not get um, uh, any funding at all from the state, um, how committed are we to the laptop proposal? Or does the board feel that, um, you know, a different way? If there's no funding, you feel one way, or if there is no parent um, support, um, when that question is answered, and I think what Marie would like to do is to get feedback from the school board how committed you are to the, to the whole laptop issue. Um, because the state funding issue, I don't think, unless um, uh, Nancy or Jeff know anything more than I do, that's not going to be something that we'll find out for um, at least for a while until the legislature acts on that, and we have to make some budget decisions. I do know that there are, there are a few communities who have included it as part of their budget, and there are, the major, vast majority of the communities are waiting and hoping uh, that the state does come through with some money for at least um, the, at least the first year. And, and I think we as well are, you know, certainly in that same situation that we're waiting and hoping that the state is going to come through, um, you know, with their proposal for um, uh, freshmen next year. Um, however, you know, we're, I guess we just need to hear how we are feeling as a board um, in, in terms of where we are. We've not done that. We've heard uh, from Gary Lenoy. We've heard from Bev, Bev Bisbee. You know, we have heard a little from the principal. So, so we know what the feeling is with the whole laptop initiative committee, um, that you've been given reports and information from the surveys, but we've never heard from the board as to where individuals are feeling. You, you've heard from the board in the sense that, that there was support for the budget, um, though, right. where there is. Right. Um, Twenty-seven thousand dollars. Right in the in the, budget. Budget. in the budget. Right. So okay. This so is something you want a decision on? It, no decision. No. I think a discussion. No, you're not making because you don't know. We're making a decision, we don't know. No, but you you want our opinions. Uh, and let's say that you have to foot the whole bill. How how committed are you to doing that? We don't have a lot of Which would be another $27,000. That was a discussion of laptop issues I thought was coming from you, oh. <laughs> not from me. <laughs> um. I'll, I'll, I'll be glad to start. Um, I, I, being a, you know, a member of the, the technology group and, and um, working with some of the people and seeing firsthand some of the presentations by Apple regarding the extension at the high school and, and the opportunity it provides to continue the, the advantages uh, for the seventh and eighth graders if it was extended. Um, I support it. I, I believe that the $27,000 um, commitment in the current budget is, uh, um, I, I, I I would look somewhere else if I had to go somewhere else. Um, if there is no funding at all, um, I believe that that larger number would would uh, have a tendency for me to ask what my trade-off would be, and I would need to know from the district leadership team, you know, their commitment and their ideas about what things might have to be given up uh, in support of, of the initiative, and. And then I need to make my decision or recommendation based on that um, because I do value their opinion because I don't want to give up something that uh, the district leadership team feels more strongly about. Um, so that kind of figure would scare me more. Marie, thank you. Well, could I just ask, are we sure that, um, that we would not be able to ask parents to help Fund. I mean, is that a pretty clear directive? We could ask I, I don't for donations, definitely. But we could not ask. Well, we could not we're require. Unsure. Yeah, I don't could not require. We're not we could ask for a donation. Um, and we contacted the com commissioner's office, and they suggested Drummond Woodson suggested we. Their opinion was that we could not require it. Um, we might be in a, in a different place if we asked for 
treated it as a donation. I guess it's kind of like when you go to a, a game and there's, a, there's someone standing at the gate asking for a donation <laughs> um, and holding your laptop, I guess. Um, it, but they suggested maybe we check with, uh, with the State Department or the Commissioner's Office. We check with the Commissioner's Office. We suggested we check with our attorney. <laughs> so I guess until it happens, there won't be a, there won't be a, a decision until someone mm -hmm. challenges it. I mean, we have we have other things that um, parents have to pay for, and we have it's a required part of a class. I mean, graphing calculator is a good example that you can't get through a, a class, some classes at the high school without it. Um, but we do that. Um, and, but it hasn't been challenged, and all high schools have that. Mm -hmm. So how, this just happens to be a more expensive uh, piece of equipment. Um, so it's a risk. No, much more. Yeah. <laughs> Well, given that, I'll just say that I, I, I think looking at the surveys that we got from, from parents and from schools, which were really predominantly very positive, I mean, I would have to, I certainly, su I support the laptop program and I'd like to see it move forward. I, but I would really like us to continue considering parent funding and in what form that might take if the state doesn't provide any amount of funding. All right. So. Okay. Thank you. Kevin? I was originally, I guess for lack of a better term, not thrilled about the laptop proposal. And having seen it in operation for a couple of years now, having listened to the students, the teachers, the parents, and further having listened to its impact on special education students, I staunchly support extend, extending the laptops into the high school to the extent that if our budget proposal is cut to find the funds elsewhere in the budget if necessary, if our proposal is adopted and no state funds come through, then something else will suffer in its place. But so far as I am concerned, I will support entirely the introduction of laptops. Okay, thank you. I guess that I feel pretty much the same way Elaine does. If I had to say that tonight, say something tonight, it would fall in that category. Okay. I guess I'd concur with Elaine and Jen as well. Okay. Okay, um, and in, in, I'll just throw in my two cents. Um, you know, I, I believe in, and have believed for a while that this is a one-time opportunity for us. You know, if, if the state comes through, um, that's wonderful. And, and, you know, we're there and, and we can keep it moving. Um, if the state doesn't and uh, we as a district and we as a school board decided not to, um, we will never have them. You know, um, you, you can't start something and then take it away and then hope that a few years from now we're going to get back to it. So, you know, I see it as something that's very important for um, these students' future. No one goes to college these days without a laptop. And this is something that certainly gives our students um, a leg up on, on what is um, what is happening and what's important and what's going to get them further ahead in the world. So, uh, you know, I too would say, I mean, I, I know an awful lot of things can happen between tonight um, and the proposal of our budget to the town council and at the end of tomorrow night. Um, and, and I guess we will take all of that information um, and then have the discussions that we need to have. And hopefully we will hear soon um, with a real answer from the state. Okay. Do you have anything to add, Tom? Okay. Um, then we can move on to new business um, and the superintendent's recommendations to athletic fee positions. Um, there are a number of, these are for uh, spring athletic fee positions um, that did not come to you. Um, 
last month, and I can read, in, read them into the record um, at the high school um, and then at the middle school, or you can <coughs> act on them individually. Um, it'll just take longer. So we usually have read them into the record um, as a group, and because of the length of the list, I think that would be, be easier unless someone has a concern with that. Are there any concerns? No? Okay. Returning high school spring coaches, uh, Mark Rena, JV Boys Baseball, Terry Long, JV Boys Lacrosse, Tom Tinsman, Freshman Baseball, Marianne Doss, JV Girls Tennis, Doug Worthley, uh, Assistant Track Coach, and Tracy Weatherby, Assistant Track Coach. New high school coaching nominations, uh, Gretchen Spadinger, JV Girls Lacrosse, and Kurt Chapin, Assistant Varsity Boys Lacrosse, and Paul Snyder, Assistant High School Track Part Time. Um, at the middle school, eighth grade baseball, Jeff Bump, eighth grade baseball, Tom Tinsman, seventh grade baseball, Roger Boynton, eighth grade softball, Steve Donovan, seventh grade softball, Steve Martin, Eighth grade track, Michael Schwartz. Seventh grade track, Joe Doan. Eighth grade boys lacrosse, Terry Long. Seventh grade boys lacrosse, Jim Dolliver. Seventh grade girls lacrosse, Ann Carney. And uh, a name that was inadvertently uh, left off at the, for the winter was middle school swim coach, Kerry Curtis. Um, we need a motion to accept these positions. Is it Dolliner, isn't it? Oh, is that Jim Dolliner? It's very difficult to be fighting. Okay, just. I move that we accept the superintendent's recommendations to all the athletic fee positions as presented. Do we have a second? Elaine? Second. Any comments or questions? Okay. All in favor? Six zero. Okay. Um, Consideration of the proposed school calendar for 2004-2005. The calendar um, for next year, um, number one, is being presented much differently. It was a suggestion um, at the um, calendar committee who, who had two meetings. There was much input from staff um, regarding this calendar, uh, but it is will be, as you can see, it can be folded and presented as a trifold. And we tried to get as much information as possible that would be meaningful to parents, especially in light of the fact that, as you are aware, um, the school system, as all schools in Maine, are really under um, the gun to complete their local assessment systems. Um, part of our problem as a district is we have not had the time available for teachers to work collaborat collaboratively as a group um, except in a high school where they did come up with a plan with study hall monitors um, to cover time for teachers to get that work accomplished. Um, on this calendar, there are, with this calendar, are several um, late start days that would allow teachers that time um, to get the, the local assessment work accomplished. Um, there is also at the back of the calendar an explanation as to why we need to do this, because obviously, unlike the school board, um, the community in general might not be aware of um, the mandates and the, um, the, the timelines that the school district is under to get uh, the local assessment work done. So that's why we've included that explanation. And also a quick reference guide, um, which is a suggestion of Elaine Maloney, which I think came out very nicely. Um, that parents can look at just to take a look at the dates that are coming up um, that are a bit different. We've also this year color-coded the calendar, um, hopefully to make it easier to read. Um, I guess to some people it might be more confusing, um, but it does kind of make the certain days that we have for, for either early release or we have that are teacher days, uh, vacation schedule, um, stand out. Because of the um, Labor Day falling um, where it does, um, we will be starting school next year um, before Labor Day, but still in September. Uh, Labor Day is very late on the 6th. 
the students will start on september first but that is the wednesday before labor day teachers will start a staggered start there will be all staff will meet on the monday pride monday before labor day in august as an entire staff but the high school will be starting the week before because of some of the work they need to do with regard to their accreditation and preparing for that they felt they really needed the time in august to do that work so they'll there's their starting schedule will be a bit different than k through eight so again the k through eight days do have additional late start days which hopefully you can see i think they're in brown there are for the most part except for two months i think there are two two late start days a month tom it does the high school start the same time as everyone else school staff will come will work will come in in august that week before but the students on thursday right the students are all starting on the first it's just the staff that are starting on different days okay and and do we still do um the thing where we have freshmen go in a day earlier and they're there by themselves first the second is for the rest of the school okay okay question kathy yeah um i had a couple questions um is the start before labor day a change from this year and last year no this year was the first year in several years that we started after labor day we the tradition usually is to start before labor day um this year because labor day was either the first or the second as early as right that um, we were able to start um, start the school year after Labor Day, but normally um, we start it before Labor Day. And I had a, a second question. Um, it started out just with a comment. Um, I'm not a personal fan of late start dates, but having said that, um, as a school board member, I'm, my understanding, and Elaine probably can correct me, but we, those were designed, those extra late start days were designed to help with the budgetary consideration of about $76,000. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. And I wanted to just bring that yeah, that's, out. Thank, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. The option to, to the late starts um, is it, it's a staffing issue. And in most, in, in, especially at the middle school in Pond Cove, um, there was a proposal at, during the budget deliberations to try to work some collaborative time for teachers to work on this during the day. And it would be a minimum, the minimum cost was $76,000 just for the middle school. And then the prices went up from there. So this was the least expensive of the options. Now we are not voting on this tonight, or are we? Well, the, the one thing in, the, in that, as you probably would guess, we get a lot of phone calls. Um, on the calendar. Um, what I would like to know is if, at least if there's some uh, agreement that usually we bring it back again for a vote later, mm -hmm. but just get kind of a, um, an informal recognition that you're comfortable with at least the vacation days and the start days, um, because that's what parents want to know. When does school start, when does it finish, and when are the vacations? Mm -hmm. Are there any questions or comments on the calendar? Okay. Questions or comments on the calendar? Then it will come back to us next right. month to be approved by the school board. Yeah, and it, 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 if there are any other major concerns, especially about the start, the end, and the vacations, is, does anyone have any concerns with, with those particular items? Okay. No? Okay. Okay, next on our list is the contract with HKTA Associates. Um, we've, the school board has uh, previously approved the contract with HKTA uh, for the uh, Pond Cove project. Um, this is the contract for the high school, for the high school project. Um, and HKTA obviously has is, is already begun work in earnest um, on the high school project. Um, the, our, the reason for the holdup of this contract, you would have had it earlier, but we wanted to uh, make sure that the architect's contract 
was in agreement with the contract we had with the construction manager because they're they kind of work work together so we asked our attorney to take now that we have agreement on the contract with with Peyton construction as far as what that contract will look like he's now looking at this contract so what I would request that the motion would be in a similar form that you had for the for the last contract was to approve this contract pending final approval from our legal counsel which we don't have yet because he's we just finished the other one and he's he hasn't had time to review it all. Do we know when we get the final review from the counsel on this? On this one it should be Pauline I within 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 days yeah. Okay thanks. Is there a motion? Jennifer? I move we approve the contract with HKTA pending approval by Drummond and Wood. Second? Elaine? Any comments or questions? I guess I wanted to just clarify approval of a Drummond and Wood some maybe to me implies that they're approving the contract and they would really just be giving suggestions or recommendations and I was wondering if we could just change that wording upon their recommendations and in case there's anything that they say is out of line because we're we're approving it is that correct? Right. Right. Better wording. But we use the wording and we can always word pending recommendation and approval. I still think they're they're telling us that they approve of it. I understand what you're saying but also you want to I understand the need to put in suggestion suggested revisals revisions and we have suggestion revisions and approval. Yeah I just didn't want to get to appear that they were approving it and I I'm not trying to split words it just right I wanted it to be clear so no one had a question. Okay do we need to make a new motion? Before we state that. Before we amend the motion is this also subject to review by the town's council? Not this contract no. It's not? No. Okay because I'm getting confused by I'm starting to get confused over who's responsible to review what. If that's if that is in fact the case then I have nothing further. No because the school board has quite often entered into contracted agreements with architectural firms which you which you have in the past with SMRT for the feasibility study in the 10-year plan which you did with HKTA with the Pond Cove project and this is this is the last of the contracts we'll have with HKTA at least with this project. I guess a question that I have though and I'm not quite sure if this affects it but the money that is being used to pay the architect according to this contract is coming coming out of the bond referendum monies and was that part of the criteria of why the town council wanted to have the opportunity to review contracts? Not that I'm aware of. Because the other payments we've had other payments come out of the bond also. Okay I just you know I just threw that out as a potential if that was. Well even so I mean even if they're approving the construction managers contract don't we need to approve it as well? Which you did. Yes we did. We did. Right. So this is the architect's contract. Even if they decide that they needed. You have to approve it anyway. We have to approve it anyway. Yeah that's fine. I guess I want to know whether I need to take this someplace further. No. Okay. You've reworded the motion? I've reworded it. Okay. And it's much better. Okay. Second time around. I move that we approve 
I meant what's the language here? The contract with HKTA Associates um, pending an acceptable opinion by legal counsel. How is that? That works. That works. I'm impressed. <laughs> Okay. I didn't and go to law a, school. A for second. Is that, that was Elaine. I was right. second again. Okay. Any further comments, questions? Okay. All in favor? Six zero. Um, and the last thing on our list: consideration of the negotiated agreement um, with the secretaries and um, ed techs. Kevin. I move that we adopt the contract between the school board and the secretaries and EdTech ones as negotiated. Seconded. Comments, questions? Have we seen a copy of this negotiated contract? It's in the packet. It is in the packet? Yeah. Okay. I didn't get to it. I'm sorry. I apologize. Oops. I believe we discussed the contract in executive it, session. Our last, last meeting. Yeah, it was yes. a month ago. Okay, yeah. I'm just, I'm not remembering. Yes. I thought yes. we did. Um, any further comments, questions? Okay, all in favor? Six, zero. Um, before we uh, conclude our meeting, I'd like to go over the um, dates of future meetings. To, oh, tomorrow night. Um, now, someone said 7 o'clock earlier. Is this meeting at 7 o'clock or 7.30? 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock. There's, a, there's the um, finance committee and school board is at 7.30, but there's a preliminary meeting at 7 It's just the meeting. And we're all supposed to be there? Yes. Okay. Um, meeting with the school board and the town council um, for the presentation of the proposed school budget. Seven o'clock, and it will not be here. It will be at community services. Um, school board workshop meeting, April 27th, uh, seven o'clock in the high school library, uh, future direction plan curriculum. Policy committee meeting, Tuesday, May 4th at 12 noon here in the Jordan Conference Room. Um, town council meeting on Monday, May 10th at 7.30, which will be the public hearing and budget adoption for our school budget. Um, finance committee meeting May 11th at 6.30 in the Jordan Conference Room, followed by our next um, regularly scheduled uh, school board meeting at 7.30. And um, we need a motion to close our meeting, go out of public session, and enter into executive session to discuss uh, contract negotiations. May I, may I bring up one small thing at the yes. end? Is this the okay time? I'd just like to express uh, my sadness at the resignation of Rich West from the school board. In the five months he was here, I thought he brought some new ideas, some intelligent and articulate uh, items to the board. I wish him best in his future endeavor, and I will miss his participation on the board. Thank you. Um, motion to end of the meeting? I move that we adjourn from public session and enter executive session as requested by the superintendent to discuss contract negotiations and to invite Paulina Portria if that's appropriate. And further note, notify the public that we will not be re entering public session. Um, a second? Jennifer? All those in favor? 6 0. Thank you. Oh.